Thanks for joining us for today's message from our series, All About the Benjamins. We know that the number one cause of stress today is money. We fight the pressures of bills, higher price of living, kid activities, and many more needs for our money. However, we can fight back and ease the stress when we begin doing money God's way. We're always so encouraged to know that God's using ministry to touch lives all across the world from what He's doing right here in Canyon, Texas. So if that's you and you have a story to share on how God's working in your life, please send an email to connect at yoursummitchurch.com. Also, if you would like to support this ministry financially, you can do so by giving online and help us bring messages just like this one to you every single week. Thanks so much for joining us, and now let's prepare our hearts to hear a word from God. So glad you're here. Let's read this passage of uh, 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 Scripture together. Uh, our text is Psalm chapter 1, verse 1 through 3 in the Amplified Bible. Today, we're going to talk about the practical prosperity principles. Now, I, I want to tell you that if you haven't been able to be at all of the worship experiences and uh, hear these four messages, this will be the fourth message today. I want you to go to the podcast, I want you to go to the webcast, and I want you to get these because they build on each other and, and definitely uh, this has not been your normal uh, talk on biblical finances. There's been a lot of different type of, of thinking, and I know that we're getting a lot of good reports back on it, and I hope you're learning something. I hope I'm doing this justice, and so today we're going to talk about more specific. We're going to get real practical today, and we're going to talk about the specifics of prosperity, what it looks like in our life, what it really is, and how we define it. And so uh, we're talking about practical prosperity principles. Let's read Psalms chapter 1, verse 1 through 3. We're reading in the Amplified Bible. Let's all read it together and go. Blessed, happy, fortunate, prosperous, and enviable is the man who walks and lives not in the counsel of the ungodly, following their advice, their plans, and purposes, nor stands submissive and inactive in the path where sinners walk, nor sits down to relax and rest where the scornful and mockers gather. But his delight and desire are in the law of the Lord and in his law, the precepts, the instructions, the teachings of God, he habitually meditates, ponders, and studies by day and by night. And he shall be like a tree, firmly planted and tended by the streams of water, ready to bring forth fruit in its season. Its leaf also shall not fade or wither, and everything he does shall prosper. Let's read that one again. And everything he does shall prosper. Let's read it again and put emphasis on everything. And everything he does shall prosper and come to maturity. Father, thank you for this word. Get it deep in our heart. Help us to embrace it, live it, and be it in Jesus' name. And everybody say it. And you can be seated. I love this passage of scripture. It is one of my favorites in the whole Bible. It's not necessarily one you would think of if I was gonna talk about financial prosperity, but I believe this is exactly where we should talk about the practical principles of prosperity because the Bible is very clear. Blessed is a man who walks not in the counsel of the ungodly, nor stands in the way of the sinner, nor sits in the seat of the scornful. But his delight is in the law of the Lord, and in that law doth he meditate day and night. And he shall be like a tree that's planted by the rivers of water. It brings forth fruit in its season. Its leaves will not wither, and whatsoever he does, it shall prosper. The Bible is very clear to us what a blessed man or woman looks like. I would rather use the term blessed than prosperous because I truly believe that, 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 that the true definition of prosperity is blessed. Uh, I, I don't believe in fate. I don't believe in happenstance. I don't believe in coincidence. I, I believe in purpose and destiny as it pertains to the will of God for our lives. And I believe God wants to bless you. That's what I believe. I believe God wants to bless you. I believe God wants to do good things for your life. And I know sometimes because of religious experiences we've had and things that we've heard people say that we don't realize that. We don't realize how God loves us, how much he cares for us. Turn your neighbor right and say, God thinks you're awesome. Come on. Turn your neighbor and tell him, God thinks you're awesome. Come on, turn to three people around you. If you, if you got three people around you, just turn to them, tap them on the shoulder, say, God thinks you're awesome. Now, I think that a lot of times we think that we, we know that we think God is awesome, but I think that we do not realize how much God thinks of us. I think we don't realize that God looks at us on, as his children, and, and, and I think my children are awesome. That's my perspective of my kids. I think they're awesome. I love them. I think they're wonderful. But it doesn't mean they always do right, and it doesn't mean I'm always happy with everything that goes on in their life, but it does mean that I think they're incredible. 
I, 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 I think that God has given me some great children, and I believe that that's how God views us. That God wants to do good things for us. The Bible very clearly says that he does. So I, don't, I, don't, I want to, if anything else, help you to understand and to change your thinking, get you to understand differently that God wants you blessed. God wants you prospered. God loves you and he thinks you're awesome. Now I say that because, not because I think God is in awe of you, because God thinks you're special. God says you were fearfully and wonderfully made. God says that, that there were books written about you in heaven, a book written about you in heaven. Your life, the destiny and purpose of your life has already been written about. And, and that's why we pray the prayer, God make manifest in my life what is in heaven. In other words, as it is in heaven, so let it be done on this earth. What we're saying to God is what you've written about me, what you've purposed for me, what you've destined for me, let it be done in me. I don't want to do something different. I don't want to go my own way. I don't want to try my own things because God, I know your way is best and it's better. And so God manifests what you want for me, what you created me for. Can you believe that anytime you're doing anything that's out of the will of God or the destiny of God for your life, you're going contrary to why you were created? It wasn't that God created, a, created you and then said, we better find something for this person to do. God had a purpose in mind when he created you. Yeah. Now think about that. So God's manifest presence on your life or his will on your life is very important. And anytime we do our own thing or go our own way or decide we're not going to do it God's way, we're literally going contrary to how we were made. And that's why we feel a conflict and conviction and even sometimes guilt when we don't go the way that we're supposed to go, because not just because it's God's will, but because he made us to go his way. Yeah, Amen? Amen? So I want to encourage you today that God wants you blessed. God's put purpose in your life. He's put destiny in your life. He wants great things for you. And there are some specific principles that he tells us this is what prosperity looks like. I know that we all define prosperity, if you were to define it according to the culture of our nation or our society or anybody in the Western world, we define prosperity as having a lot of stuff. We define, we define prosperity about how much money you make in your check. We define prosperity about how you live, where you live, what you drive. And all of these things are okay and they're fine, but they're the results of prosperity. They are not the goal. I'm going to say that again, good, having nice things and wonderful things and being blessed financially, those are all good things. It's fine, but those are the results of a prosperous life, not the goal of a prosperous life. Yeah. Amen. And it's okay to have the results of a prosperous life. Come on, somebody say amen. amen. God wants you to be blessed. There's nothing wrong with being blessed. But a lot of times in being blessed, we get it out of order. We think that blessed looks a certain way and we go crazy trying to accomplish being blessed. Uh, uh, prosperous, here's some prosperous thoughts. There are things that prosperous people do and there are things that prosperous people don't do. The deception of prosperity is that it somehow is mysterious. Uh, it feels like we begin to think it's always completely elusive to us. So in our attempt to obtain it, we um, find ourselves being deceived by it and obsessed with it. Uh, we should pay far more attention to our worshiping of God and our relationship with God and our spiritually based priorities than we do chasing after wealth and money or the opportunities for wealth and money. Ask yourself a question. Why was Solomon, who was one of the richest, if not the richest man to ever live on this planet, why was he rich? He was rich because when he was time for him to come into the kingdom as the king and King David handed the kingdom over to him and said, Solomon, I want you to be the next king. He felt ill-equipped to do it. He felt like I'm too young. I'm too inexperienced. I don't have the ability. I don't know what to do. I'm not David. I'm not like David. He has all this experience and all this time put in and all this leadership ability and all this talent and gifting and I'm not like him. And so when God, when he, when he came to God, he made a sacrifice. And it's interesting that when he made this sacrifice to God, he made the most enormous sacrifice you could possibly make. The only thing that was required is just a little, and he gave over an abundance in an offering to God in the temple. And he went to prayer, and he sought God, and he gave to God. And when he gave in that offering and he sought God, God said to him, Solomon, ask anything of me, and I'll give you anything you want. 
Now, I wonder if God was to ask us today, I'll give you anything you want, I wonder what we would say. I wonder if we would ask for specific things. I wonder if we would ask for things that were inappropriate. I wonder if we'd ask for things to consume them upon our own lust. I hope that that wouldn't be true. But in this opportunity, this moment, God said to Solomon, I'll give you anything you want. And Solomon knew the task that was before him. And here's what Solomon prayed. God, I need wisdom. God, I need wisdom. I don't know how to do this. I've got knowledge. I've got understanding, but I don't have wisdom. I don't know how to properly apply all the stuff that I know to be able to lead this nation. David was a great king, and even still to this day, David is considered a great king. If you talk about the king of Israel, everyone refers to King David. David was an enormous personality. He was an incredible king. He was a great follower of God. God described David as a man after my own heart. But God had now, David had now passed on and he had imparted to Solomon his desire that Solomon would lead the nation. And Solomon cried out to God and said, God, please give me wisdom. I need wisdom. I need to know how to do this. And here's what God said to him. He said, Solomon, because you didn't ask for money and you asked for wisdom, because you didn't ask for property and you asked for wisdom, because you didn't ask for things, you asked for wisdom, because you didn't ask for for peace, you ask for wisdom. I'm going to give you money and peace and, and prosperity and blessing on your life because that's what comes with wisdom. In our pursuits for the things that seem like what prosperity would be or blessing would be, we miss the mark sometimes because we're asking for the wrong things. We're praying for the wrong things. We're living for the wrong things. Jesus, in a parable of the, the seed, he said this, that the thorns that choked out the growth of the seeds represented the busyness of life and the deceitfulness of riches. Now, I know a lot of people take the scripture and they use it to say riches are bad or money's bad. We know that money's not bad. We know that we've already talked about this. You can go back and listen to the other sessions and the other messages on this series. Money's not bad. And, and rich, being wealthy is not bad. God wants to bless our life even in the area of wealth. But God didn't promise to make anybody rich. Come on, somebody. God didn't say, I'm going to make you rich or I'm going to send money from heaven. And, you know, one day you're going to be walking home and a bag of money is going to fall out of heaven, hit you on the head, and your life's going to be changed forever. Some of y'all playing the lottery. Oh, God, someday you're going to give me the lottery. Now, you know what I think about the lottery. That's, a, that's ill-gotten gains. That's not the way to build your wealth. But if you play it and if you win it, pay your tithes, somebody. That's all I'm saying. Come on, somebody. <laughs> Listen to what I'm saying, though. Jesus, when he said the seed, the sower, he went out to sow seed. And he sowed some among the ground, the hard ground there, the wayside. He sowed some in, in, in very shallow soil. He sowed some among thorns. He sowed some in good soil. And he talks about what all that represented. He talks about different things that that represented. But then he comes back, and, 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 and I want to draw particular attention to the idea of the seed sown in the thorns because he says something that... It, to me, in my heart, it seems prophetic for today's culture. It seems prophetic for the 21st century. He said, he said, be careful because when the seed is sown and the seed represents the word, the word of God, when it's put in your heart, be very careful because the thorns represent the busyness of life. Now listen to what I'm saying. The busyness of life and the deceitfulness of riches. In other words, he was saying uh, these thorns represent this idea that busyness or riches will satisfy you. That busyness or riches will be a source to you. That busyness or riches will somehow enhance or bless your life. And honestly, in our day, in our culture, that's what we think. The busier we are, the, think we, the better we think our life is. We think we're accomplishing something by running around, going, 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 going. And God's saying that's deceitful because it makes us feel like our life is full, but it's full of the wrong things. He says the deceitfulness of riches tells you I'm your source. Riches tell you I'm your source. I will provide for you. Money is your source. Wealth is your source. The problem is, ladies and gentlemen, that it's not. And money and busyness and all of these things cannot do for you what God can do for you. So if we put our trust in those things, our own busyness, our own striving, our own working, we put our uh, uh, trust in money itself, it deceives us. And what happens is that word that's 
been planted in us. It's trying to grow up. It's trying to mature. It's trying to bear fruit in our life. And instead, those thorns of busyness and deceitfulness of riches choke it out. And there's no spiritual life left in us. We put on the motions. We go through the motions. But we don't have that inner connectedness to God. Our spiritual life has been choked out. We have no spiritual breath left. And then we're trying to plot on as Christians and trying to plot. And what we need to understand is it's not those things that give us life. Now, some people have taken that idea and said, all riches are bad and all working is bad and all busyness is bad. We need to understand that there is moderation in everything and it's in the trusting of Jesus that makes things good. It's not that all life is bad and all riches are bad and all wealth is bad. It's that we have to do it in the proper perspective. Somebody say amen. Amen. We, we must be very careful not to accept a poverty mentality. God did not mean for us to be poverty or poor. He didn't mean for us to be beat down. He didn't mean for us to be overwrought. Rot. He didn't mean for us to have a bad life or a horrible life. But at the same time, we need to realize that prosperity comes as a result of practically living out godly principles. It's not the obsessive pursuit of success or money. It's the pursuit of uh, 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 it, it, it's not the pursuit of money or things that brings real prosperity. It's the pursuit of God. That, that's what brings real prosperity. What brings real blessing is the pursuit of God. When we are obsessed with chasing things, even if we don't obtain them or do obtain them, we'll be, it will be an empty success without fulfillment and contentment because things cannot give what only God can give. Here's the truth for you. I'm not saying you cannot have nice things. Somebody say hallelujah. Hallelujah. (laughs) Everybody say hallelujah. How about that? I'm not saying you shouldn't attempt to be successful. That's nonsense. I'm saying the real way to be successful, the real way to have prosperity in your life, the real way to have true success that blossoms on the inside and flourishes on the outside is to pursue God with all your heart. I love the word blessed to define the word prosperous. Psalms 1 says that the full meaning of the word blessed is happy. Everybody say happy. Happy. Come on, tell your face, I'm happy. Happy. Smile at me and say happy. Happy. I'm happy because I'm happy. Come on, everybody, you know that song came in your mind. I'm happy. The Bible says to be blessed is to be happy. Uh, uh, to be fortunate, not in terms of fate, but to have goodness in your life, good fortune in your life, to be prosperous, to be envied. The, the Bible says that people should look on your life, and I believe it's referring directly to unbelievers, that unbelievers should look on your life and they should say, I wish I had what they have. I wish I had the peace that they have. I I wish that I had the prosperity that they had. I wish that I had the bless, not an evil envying, but people should look at your life and say, I wish my life were different. I wish my life looked more like that. Not just because you drive a nice car, not just because you have a nice home, not just because of where you live or what group you're a part of, but because your life is different. God has put favor on your life. God has put blessing on your life. God has put good things on your life. So when people look on your life, they say to themselves, I wish my life looked more like that. Now, this is what is interesting to me. It seems like a lot of times as believers, we spend all of our time trying to look like them. And then we wonder why they're not looking at us saying, I wish my life was more like them because you're busy trying to look like them. We don't want prosperity the world's way. We want prosperity God's way. We want the blessing of God on our life. We want prosperity on our life because it gives an example of what God can do in your life. Sometimes I've been favored with things that people would say, how in the world did you get that opportunity? It wasn't because of my ability. It wasn't because I'm so awesome. It wasn't because of something I did. It's the favor of God on my life. People often say to me, man, you always seem to be at the right place at the right time. No, it's the favor of God on my life. I want that for everybody in this house, but we have to understand it's not some magical potion or some formula that comes drop out of the sky. It's intentional. It's something that God wants to do, and we have to live out the principles. There are blessed things that uh, prosperous people do. There there are things that blessed people don't do. There are blessed things that blessed people do. And, And I want us to look at that real quickly today. 
Number one, blessed people, and I want all the young people especially to listen to me today and hear this and write this down and think about this because it's something you need to know. And then I want all the adults here to realize that you say all these and we say all these colloquialisms to our kid, these great statements, these great things to tell them, hey, you can do it. And hey, if you show me your friends, I'll show me your future. And somehow we misapply that and don't, give it, don't apply it to our own lives. The truth is, it's as true for you as an adult as it is for your young person. So number one, blessed people don't follow the advice, plans, or purpose of the ungodly. Why are we looking to the world to give us the, 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 the thinking of how we should think to be blessed? Have we ever wondered that? Why do we look to the world to tell us how to be blessed? Why do we look to the world to tell us how to handle our money? Why do we look to the world to tell us the friends we should have? Why, why do we do that? I think in all of us, it's the same need, the need to fit in, the need for people to like me. Turn, turn to your neighbor and say, I, will, I like to be liked. Some of you are like, I'm not doing, I'm not turning, I'm not saying it because I don't really care. Yes, you do. You care. Every human person cares. Every human being likes to be liked. But you know what? I've come, my pastor used to say this. I've come to the conclusion that I like me. God likes me. My pastor used to always say, God likes pa Kirk Pancras. I'm going to say it right. God likes David Gadbury. God likes me. And, and, and I like me. And, and people like me. And if you don't like me, it's only because you don't know me. If you really knew me, you'd like me. <laughs> Come on, somebody. Some of us need to get some confidence in here and quit worrying about people liking us and stop surrounding ourselves with people who do not have any business speaking into our lives. Are you with me? Blessed people do not follow the advice, plans, or purpose of the ungodly. They understand something very important. They understand that the right close relationships and men mentors in our lives matter. You show me your friends, I'll show you your future. It's the truth. Well, you're saying that we don't need friends who are unsaved. No, we need a lot more friends who are unsaved, especially in this church. Because when I ask the question, man, who are you inviting to church? People say, well, people I know go to church somewhere. Well, listen, if you, everyone you know is go to church somewhere and they actually really do go to church, you need to find some new friends who don't go to church. We need to be friends with people who don't know Jesus. We need to have relationships with people like that. But they cannot be our covenant relationships. They cannot be our close, tight-knit advisors in our lives. You cannot be taking advice from people who do not have the same faith stand that you have, that don't have the same vision that you have, that don't understand God the way you do, that don't understand the Bible the way you do, because they're going to lead your life based on the flesh, based on their own personal fears, based on what they think and their opinions. You need somebody who can back what they're telling you up by the Word of God. You need somebody who will believe with you. You need somebody who will set your faith and say, you can dream that dream. Not only can you dream that dream, but that dream could come true in your your life because God's put that in you. You need somebody who'll stand beside you and say, come on, let's do this. I'll pray for you. I'll be there for you. If you fall, I'll pick you back up and I'll help you through this. Come on. That's the kind of people you need to surround your life with. You don't surround your life with people of status or for status. You don't surround your life with people who are the right people to be around as far as the community is concerned. You need to surround your life with people who can truly make a difference in lifting you and strengthening you and caring for you. It doesn't mean that you dismiss all friends who don't know Jesus. That would would be nonsense well Jesus was friend of sinners sure he was but they weren't his best friends come on let's be smart about what the word of God says and blessed people and prosperous people they put the right people around them people who've gone further than they've gone people who've done more than they've done people who understand something they don't understand come on put the right people around you don't be afraid and intimidated of those kind of relationships but put those relationships around you I'm constantly putting people who've done more and gone more in ministry done more in ministry and have accomplished more in ministry around myself and listening to them and going and seeing them and putting myself in front of them so that they can teach me and train me I'm always learning. I've been doing this for 25 years full time. I, I'm a 46 year old man. I'm continually learning and surrounding myself with people who believe and people who care and people who will teach and train. And I set myself under that. Why? Because I know this principle that if I'm going to be blessed and I'm going to be prosperous, I got to surround myself with the right people. Yeah. Yeah. Amen. Good. Number two, they are not submitted or passive about walking the same path as those who are missing the mark. 
Man, some of us need to change the path we're walking on. We're walking directly in line with our current culture. And the thing I've noticed about prosperous people, truly blessed people in the kingdom of God, the thing I've noticed about them is they do not mind being counter to the culture. Everybody else won't save, they'll still save. Everybody else is in debt, they'll get out of debt. Everybody else is, uh, won't give, they give. It doesn't matter what everybody else is doing because they have a plan and a purpose on their life and they're going to live that out. They will live counter to the culture. You say you're not talking practicals, you're talking philosophy. I, I'm going to get to the practicals in just a minute, but we have to, we have to found uh, the basis of our thinking on this and understand that a blessed person, as the Bible describes it, is a person who surrounds himself with the right people, number one. Two, they go counter to the culture. They don't care what everybody else is doing. They're not comparing themselves with anybody else. They're not keeping up with the Joneses. They don't even know who the Joneses are. No offense to the Joneses in the room. <laughs> the actual Joneses. <laughs> you know, that elusive Joneses out there that everybody's trying to keep up with. Everybody's trying to, I got to do this and I got to do that because my neighbor down here is doing it. They don't do that. They know where they're going and they do not, they are not moved or pushed by other people's opinions. Number three, they do not let their guard down or get into agreement with the cynical, scornful, or those who mock truth. They are uncompromising when it comes to doing the right things and doing things right. They have no room for bad attitudes, and they have no room for doubt, fear, and cynicism. And they have no room for a lack of integrity. People who are blessed, prosperous people, according to the kingdom, are people who absolutely have a great attitude. They're, they're positive. They're people who love God. They love people. They love life. And they're positive. You get around them, they just lift you up. They get around you, they speak life into your life. They care. That they're excited people. Sometimes they're so excited, you, get, you don't even want to be around them because they're too excited. I've had people tell me, I don't like Joel Osteen. How do you not like Joel Osteen? Well, he's just too fluffy, fluffy, and positive. And You're a Christian. You should be fluffy, fluffy. You should be positive. Come on, we could use some positive. Well, I just, you know, God just wanted me to be humble. And obviously God wants you to be ugly. Come on, somebody. We got to quit. We got to quit being religious and start being positive. Come on. Well, it's more than about positivity in life. Let me tell you some people who are prosperous, blessed people are positive people. They're not prosperous and blessed because they're, they're not trying to be positive in order to be prosperous and blessed. They're prosperous and blessed because they are positive. That's just their nature. They have decided. They've made a decision. I'm going to have a good attitude. Some of us just have a bad attitude. We see the glass, ha ha gl the glass. We see the glass half empty all the time. You, something great could happen. I mean, I just have friends that something great could happen. Like, I, I, you know, even if you won some, like, some, something and you, you've got a windfall of money, I know people that would just, just oh, that's, that's horrible. That's horrible. You're going you're, you're to spend all that money in two days and you're going to be in debt and, and the government's going to take a half of it. I mean, you know, my God. I'm like, shut up, man. Just let me enjoy my winnings. <laughs> Not that I'm playing the lottery, but come on, somebody. You could do something positive and somebody's going to see something negative. I, prosperous, blessed people, they're just not like that. It's not critical of everybody. They're just waiting to judge everything. Yeah. I mean, who died and made people the judge of everything and everybody? Come on, let's have a good attitude. Blessed, prosperous people have a positive attitude and they have integrity. They're honest. Come on, have we heard that word enough lately? No, they are honest. Yeah. They do what's right and they do things right. They're honest. They don't cut corners. They don't cheat people. They don't do things the world's way. They do things God's way. Come on. Blessed people do this. They don't do those things. Blessed people do this. They habitually and consistently meditate, ponder, apply, and practice God's way of doing things. I told you already before that God, God created you a way to do certain things and he gave you the word to tell you how to do those things. And if we go contrary to that, that's why we feel so conflicted most of the time. A lot of times people feel conflicted. Christians feel conflicted all over a giving issues because we're not obeying God in our giving. The average Christian, if you, if you looked and averaged all Christianity across the world, the average Christian gives 2% of their income. God requires a tenth. 
10%. I saw a statistical uh, 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 research study done that said, and I, can't, I don't know all the numbers, I'll find them someday and I'll, I'll read them to you, but it said that if every Christian, every person who calls himself a Christian actually gave only, only 10% of their income, they just gave the tithe, they didn't give anything else, nothing over and above, that every need in every church in every nation would be met, that all the hunger in the world would be met, all the water problems in the world would be met, and there would be billions left over. Now think about that. I think most of the time we get conflicted in our life with God, not because, not because uh, uh, we're sinning horribly, but because we're disobeying God in just the smallest ways, just small degrees of things. I just really don't want to do it your way. God, I just really want to do it my way. And it doesn't work your way because you were built to do it his way. <laughs> Somebody say amen. amen. It's a setup. It's a setup for your blessing. It's a setup for your prosperity. It's a setup for a life that you could only live under the favor of God. It's a setup for God to be able to do good things and big things in your life. That's what surrender is all about. Amen. They stay planted, established, and connected to their spiritual source. They stay in the flow. Everybody say, they stay in the flow. Come on, say it with some feeling. They stay in the flow. Say like, say, hey, yo, they stay in the flow. So you're like, I am not saying that. I will not say it. Hey, they stay in the flow. God has created, listen to me, God has created a flow for his people. He's created a flow of favor, a flow of resource for his people. Uh, one is communion with him, prayer, seeking his face, a direct line. Somebody said that, that was the first wireless phone. Just call God. He's always available. Prayer, studying his word, living the principles of God, walking out the principles of God, living according to his word. That was another flow. The church and in, in the culture we live, I'm sad to say that for some reason the church has a bad name. I, I'm sad to say that people have characterized the church inappropriately. Some people have been hurt in the church, but they're hurt other places and they don't characterize those places like that. I mean, they're hurt in the church and I can never go back to church because someone at the church hurt me. But you got hurt on your job, but you still go to your job. It, we as human beings have somehow, and the devil has won a victory in some people's lives by saying church isn't good or church isn't what you should do, or you don't really have to be church and go to Christian. Can I tell you something? What does the Bible define the church as? The body of Christ. Right. So if the church is the body of Christ, you cannot separate Christ from his body. So when we say to ourselves, I don't need the church, I just need to be in relationship with God, you are saying something that is impossible to do. Because if the church is the body of Christ, however you treat Christ or however you treat the church, that's how you're really treating Christ. Yeah. Well, I don't need church. I don't have to go to church. I've got other things to do. Instead of church, I'll just read my Bible or I'll pray. Blah, blah. And here's what I find out. Most people who don't go to church or really seek God in church, they really don't keep up with those other areas either. What I want to say to you is the church is a powerful force in the kingdom and the church is for you and the church is a blessing for you and you should be a part of the church and you should stay in that flow. Every time the doors are open, you should be in the church. Every time a ministry opportunity avails itself to you, you should be in the church. You should be teaching your kids. There's nothing more important than a relationship with Jesus and his church because everything can come and go. Everything will come and go. But people who are in relationship with God and his word will not come and go. I want to tell you something. Everything else will fail in this world, but not God and not his word and not the way he set things up. So in all of our doings, we need to understand we're sending a clear message. If you want to be a prosperous, blessed person, stay in the flow, stay in prayer, stay in the word and stay in the house so that you're getting life given to you and joy given to you and encouragement given to you and peace given to you. God wants to do great things in your life. Come on, somebody, stay in the flow. Tell your neighbor, say, stay in the flow. Bless people, stay in the flow. Bless people, prepare to produce when it's time. They're ready. Bless people are ready. I'm not going to go into all of this, but they're ready. When it's time to produce, they're ready to produce. I think in our culture, we want gratification immediately, so we look at delayed gratification as a negative. But delayed gratification is a biblical principle. Uh, you need, if nothing else, teach your children delayed gratification. Every time your child asks for something, you do not have to say yes. Uh, what? All the kids in here said, what? Uh, no, don't mess, with, don't mess with that. 
It's the truth. You don't have to say yes. Why? Sometimes you need to say no on purpose. Not because you can't do it, but because on purpose, I'm not doing it. I'm going to make you wait. Well, why? There's no reason to be like that to your kids. Absolutely, there's a reason to be like that to your kids. Because guess what? When they leave your home, they're going to go into life. And guess what? Life's going to make them wait all the time. It's, how many farmers in the house? Any farmers? Raise your hand if you're a farmer. Raise your hand if you know a farmer. Raise your hand if you're connected to farming or ranching in any way. Raise your hand. We're all in Canyon. Please, everybody, just raise your hand. <laughs> hey, we're, we're one of the top 10 most beautiful towns in Texas. Come on, somebody. That was th this week. I was like, yeah. It's all because of you. Mm -hmm. so, so in the Bible, there's a principle that says from the beginning, there is seed and then there's harvest. But there's something in between seed and harvest. Somebody tell me what it is. Time. Seed, time, harvest. Everybody say it with me. Seed, time, harvest harvest. Say it one more time. Seed, time, harvest. We've got a problem. Our problem in this culture is we don't like the time part. We don't like the time part. We want there to be seed and harvest. I want to go out today and plant some seed and tomorrow I want to come out and it, like we just moved into a new home and our whole backyard is dirt. And so I've got to plant some seed in there. And here's what I want to happen. I want to just plant some seed and the next day, I want to come out and just be a lush, beautiful, already mowed and manicured lawn. Somebody say amen to that. Hallelujah. And I may even get carried away and go get some sod because I can't stand the thought of waiting for seed to come up. Come on, somebody. We just don't like seed, time, and harvest. But here's what I've learned about blessed people. Blessed people understand the process, and they're not afraid of it. They prepare in the process. They cultivate, they water, they plan, they think. They've planted the seed, now they're waiting and the harvest is coming in, they know it. And it's so much joy in the harvest. There's so much hope in the harvest. There's so much uh, anticipation. But if we all play this game financially where we're expecting immediate gratification, we will not be blessed. Our life will be cursed financially, why? Because you cannot build a great financial picture on immediate gratification. It cannot be done. So everybody said, prepare for, for the pro through the process. Come on, prepare through the process. I got to move on. Uh, number four, creates margin so as to not lose unnecessarily. The Bible says it's planted by the river of water. It will not lose, its, it will, its leaves will not wither. Sometimes we lose in life and we wither in life and we wilt in life simply because we have no margin in life. We just burn ourselves out. Because we don't have any margin in our money. We take everything to the edges. We don't have any margin in our time. We take everything to the edges. But what this says is the tree is planted by the river of water. So it's constantly receiving resources and it's constantly got margin or manageable things in its life. If we push everything to its limit, even beyond natural processes and natural way of doing things, what happens is we leave no margin and our leaves do wither and we do wilt simply because two reasons. Number one, we have no margin. And number two, we get disconnect from the source. So people who are blessed people and prosperous people, they create margin so as not to lose unnecessarily. It's unnecessary for you to burn yourself out. It's unnecessary for you to lose financially. It's unnecessarily, if you can just get your mind around the fact that it doesn't have to be tomorrow, and if I consistently do some things now, I will achieve that goal. The harvest is coming to my life. Somebody say amen. amen. And then number five, they allow the principles of the Bible to affect every area of their life. They said, whatever he does, it will prosper. Whatever. In other words, he's saying, I'm allowing the application of the blessing and favor of God to cover my entire life. I will not compartmentalize. I will not say, God, bless this part and that part, but I'm not giving you this part. I just say, God, have your way across my life and do with me as you will. And that's how blessed people think and prosperous think people think. So let's, 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 take some derivative principles from these principles we've already talked about. And, and, and let's just get really practical. So this is where you could take some notes, some, some think things through here. Spend time thinking about your money matters. 
I believe that most money problems in the home are systemic. In other words, I believe we've created certain systems, and you say, well, we don't have any systems. We're completely disorganized. <laughs> Come on. You know who you are. It's like, man, is he talking to me? I'm not moving. I'm not going to move because if I move, he'll, they'll know it's me. Listen, it's most people. Can I tell you something? That we need to get to the place where we understand that there are ways of doing things, and even if by default, even if we're disorganized and we're not purposefully doing any systems, you create systems that are negative system based on not doing any systems. Do you get what I'm saying? Because what happens is we, we, we create ways of doing things based on bad habits or wrong thinking. I'll give you an example. When you buy something, do you ask how much it is or do you ask how much is it a month? Because these two questions denote two different things. One implies a prosperous mentality that says, I'm going to wait until I have the money to pay for that and I will get the best price because I'll put cash on the barrel head, as they say. Right? The other is, I'm willing to incur interest charges over time and, and continue this lifestyle style and, and this habit of, of buying things by month. By credit. And I'm not telling you that it's bad to have credit. I know that there's some people that talk about debt reduction and debt elimination. And I think everybody, all of us, we're on a path right now to debt elimination. And we believe in God to do that for us and help us to continue to be consistent and accomplish that. And I think that's great. But I'm not telling you it's, it's a bad thing to have a credit card or to get credit because credit's important to your life. What I am telling you is be disciplined. And when you have some kind of credit, pay it off every month. Don't allow the enemy to steal money out of your pocket because you're buying things you can't afford because you have credit to do it. Ooh, ooh, everybody turn your neighbor and go. <laughs> How do we change the system? How do we change the system? Be honest about, wrong. turn your neighbor right now. Come on, turn it, three neighbors and say, be honest. Come on. Be honest. Be honest about the financial picture in your life. One of the biggest problems that people have in changing the financial picture of their life, <coughs> excuse me, is denial. Just refusing to admit that I have a problem or refusing to admit that we're living too close to the margin or refusing to admit that we're spending too much or refusing to admit that we can't afford the lifestyle we've created for ourselves. If you really want wealth and prosperity in your life, then you have to be honest about where you are and do the hard work of changing from where you are to where you need to be. So how do we change it? Be honest, evaluate your current financial practices, and do the hard work of changing them. Realize that systems can be a default of bad habits, and you may not even realize you're operating this way until you stop to think about it. One of the biggest problems is people don't even, they're so busy, they don't stop to even think about these issues in their life, and so it just perpetuates throughout the history of their life into their children. They study. They think about, ponder God's way of doing things prosperous people do. Most people who struggle with financial things, which statistically are most people, do so because they refuse to evaluate, admit to the hard work, admit to do the hard work, uh, and change doesn't happen. Because let, let me tell you something, change doesn't just happen. It doesn't. It happens intentionally. You can't change unless you intend to change and you make the necessary actions to change. Everybody say amen. Number two, consistency is the key. I'm getting close to the end. Consistency is the the key. It's very important that you get consistent in your financial life. Blessed and prosperous people are consistent people. They're patient people and they will work things out. Take the, take the emotion out of it and make a decision. Everybody turn to your neighbor and say, make a decision. You have to take the emotion out. Determine the principles you will live by and then create a pattern or habit to live by those principles. Make that habit your lifestyle. Here's what I'd encourage you to do. Start here. We will give. We will save. We will live below our means. Make that decision. We will give. We will save. We will live be below our means. Make your decision once and then live by it. Create a system where you don't have to decide each week that you're going to do that because that's emotion. Well, what do you mean by that? Well, don't 
don't spend all your money or pay your bills and everything like that and then say, all right, now I'm going to give or now I'm going to save. Because now you're basing if I will do this if I have money left over instead of doing it first and then living below your means. Uh, one thing that I encourage you to do, if you, if you can't do it any other way, and most people can't, I would encourage you, set your giving up automatically so that your tithe is automatically given. Before you even touch your income, set it up automatically. Set up savings to yourself automatically. You say, well, I want to invest. And, and that's another thing that we do sometimes. We start thinking, I'm going to make financial change. And we go out and we do all the study and we, get, and we have all these grandiose ideas. I'm going to pay all my debt off and I'm going to invest in this. And I'm going to invest in that. And then you don't do anything because you're over your head already. Just do some basic steps first. Be consistent with those steps and then let God tell you and show you and get some advice from some godly financial people, which we have a lot in this church that would be more than happy to give you some advice about what to do with your money. It's encouraging to me that we have a body like that. And I just want to say, I just want to say, take the steps necessary consistently and then you can go further but right now just take the steps automatically give automatically save then you don't touch it it's not a decision every week am i going to give this week am i going to save this week no it's already done you say well man i'm not at a point where i've got no margin and if i do that my bills won't get paid well first fix your situation but i'm going to encourage you to start giving immediately you may not be able to save to yourself immediately but i'm encourage you to give immediately man that's presumptuous for you to say that pastor because you're a pastor and that means giving to the church well you're not giving to me personally you're giving to the church you're giving to a spiritual thing you're giving to where god this is the old this is what god said will bless your life when you give so uh, if if it's me and i'm telling you I, i've been in these situations if it's me i'm giving first i'm giving first because i know what god has said god said he'll bless the rest if i'll give him my best that was a rhyme and that was good that's what he said <laughs> He'll bless the best if you give him, he'll bless the rest if you give him your best. That's the truth. Now, I'm not saying for you to go all hog crazy and give what you can't afford. I'm saying give your tithe and deal with your finances. And then as you can give more, give more, right? So make your decisions once and live by it. Let take the emotion out of it. Then live below your means. Everybody say that with me. Live below your means. What does this basically mean? Don't buy things you can't afford. That's what it means. Yeah, but my kids want this and my family wants that. And my family. Make a priority list. What is most important to your life and the success of your family and the success of your future and base your decisions on that, not on the emotions of what everybody wants. Well, my kids want to be a part of this. They want to be a part of that. They can't this time. You, if you, 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 let, me, let me tell you something about finances, and, and I've got to close, but let me tell you what, something about finances. A week turns into two, turns into three, turns into four, turns into six months, turns into a year, turns into two years, turns into ten years. And I know people in my life right now that have no retirement, they have no money, and all because they intended to someday start doing these principles but just never did. And we think it's going to come someday. It's not going to come until you make the decision that I'm not going to buy things that I can't afford. And I'm not going to, I'm not going to do things blessing my children or blessing my spouse or blessing. Every, you're, you're, what you're doing is thinking you're blessing and really you're cursing. You're creating a negative financial future because you have to do something right now. I know this is tough talk, isn't it? It's tough talk, but it's right talk. And it's talk we need to have. Because our lives largely are out of balance. And blessing and prosperity is in not the balance as the world sees it, but the balance as the Word of God sees it, which is a radical, revolutionary way of thinking according to the world. Right? Amen? Are you guys with me? Yeah. I hope this is seeping in. Anybody getting anything right now? Yeah. Let me hear you. Are you getting anything out of this? Yeah. And the third thing is timing is important. Learn to love the process. The process prepares you for producing. Don't short circuit the process. Don't take shortcuts and rob yourselves from long-term successes. I was going to give you an illustration, but I'm not going to. That stands on its own. I already talked a little bit about it. Number four, do things and buy things that fit within the margin of your expenditures. Don't spend things you can't afford. Think about it. Save about it. Let your, listen, don't, don't, don't even hide that from your kids. Tell them, hey, we're going to save. You don't have to put on a show for your kids and act like you're rich. Act like you got more money than you have. 
Because one day you will have a lot more money than you even need if you will obey these principles and live by these principles. You understand what I'm saying? So what we have to do then with our kids is we have to say, hey, listen, we could do that, but I'll tell you what we're going to do. We're going to save, and this is how much time it's going to save. We're all going to contribute. We're going to save. And then when we get to this point, we'll be able to do that. It's fun to do that because now you're involving your kids in the process of understanding and learning what it takes to make money, learning what it takes to uh, 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 spend money, learning what it takes to budget money. It's very important. You're creating the principles of wealth for your children. You know, I, I've, I've come to realize that most people in our culture are just like, it's just like the sex talk. Nobody has talk about sex with their kids. Neither do they have a talk about finances. We, we need to get to talking about this and letting our kids experience it so they learn it when they grow up. Good. Are you with me? Yeah. And this is the last one. Faith should be a permanent fixture in your financial picture. Faith. All these principles mean nothing without faith, to be honest. All these principles, if you live by these principles, they are the picture of faith. If I'm given to God first, that's faith because I'm believing God that, that everything else is going to be okay. But you know what? If we actually lived by this originally and didn't have all this uh, going up to the edge of our margin, <laughs> the truth is we wouldn't even have to have a lot of faith to tithe. And remember, tithing isn't giving, it's returning. We're returning what already belongs to God to Him. Right? Uh, number five, faith should be a permanent fixture in your financial picture. According to Margaret Lynch and her research, there are four ma major money mindsets, and I'm going to add a fifth. Number one, the debt mindset. The debt mindset looks like this. You don't want to have this mindset, but many of us have this mindset. Uh, borrow, spent, spend. Borrow, spent, spend. Because that's how you live your life. If I want something, I borrow money to get it. And then any money I get in my income, it's already spent because I've borrowed the money and it already goes to my debt. And then I spend after that, which is a disaster waiting to happen. Come on, somebody say amen. How many have ever been in that cycle of disaster in your life? Come on, don't shut me down because I'm preaching good. Number two, break even mindset. Spend, then save if I have anything left over. Spend, then save if I have anything left over. This is a setup for future failure. Number three, comfortable mindset. I save first, then I spend. Number four, a wealthy or rich mindset. Leverage your money to make more money, then spend. So businesses and entrepreneurship and investments, and then you spend after that, after you've made money with your money. That's how wealthy people or rich people, according to her, think. I want to add a fifth, faith mindset. Give, save, spend, invest. I really believe that being prosperous is not the goal in our life, it's the result. The goal is doing the will of God. All of our money matters should have a component of faith. This is the true reason for the system of giving that God has given us. Everybody, why did God give us tithe? Why did God tell us to sow seed as our money? Why? It's the true reason for the system of giving that God has given us. Here's why. Because giving kills greed. Giving instills trust. Giving breaks barriers of selfishness on our lives. Giving applies faith to our finances. Doing money God's way disallows money the ability to control us. We cannot serve two masters, nor do we want to. We can serve God, who is a benevolent father, who loves to bless his children, or we can serve money, who is a slave master, a taskmaster, who loves to control, and at its very best that it has to offer is a well-funded emptiness. I choose God. I choose God's way of doing things. His principles that change our lives for the better. I know this has been very practical. I know that you, you might have wanted more inspiration, but I just want to tell you, I believe that if we'll start living by these principles, and, and some people in this room probably are, and some people are close, and some people are far off, and some people don't even, can't even see the far off people. But the truth is that I believe if we'll just obey God's word and we'll live according to these principles, it will be revolutionary, and you will prosper, and you will have good success. Mm -hmm.